Good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Chelsea from Greenlight and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Nadia Lulusu presenting the paperback edition of her book, Aftershocks. She'll be talking with Toke Hilarin, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just wanna say a huge thanks to Nadia, Tove, and the team at Simon & Schuster for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make this space for conversation and connection. Now, just a few housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they cannot see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and there are a couple of different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. That's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. And importantly, tonight's featured book, Aftershocks, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person in our bookstore locations, noon to 7 p.m. every day of the week. And you can purchase Nadia's book and many others on site. Or order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. I'll drop that by link in the chat. And Nadia stopped by our store to sign copies of the book, so you can get a signed book by request while supplies last. Make sure to in indicate your signed copy request and order comments at checkout when ordering online, or look for signed copies when you visit the store. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Our interviewer tonight is Tope Falaran. He is a Nigerian American writer based in Washington, DC. He serves as executive director of the Institute for Policy Studies and the Land and Visiting Lecturer in Creative Writing at Georgetown University. He has garnered many awards for his writing, including the Kane Prize for African Writing and the Whiting Award for Fiction. He was educated at Morehouse College and the University of Oxford, where he earned two master's degrees as a Rhodes Scholar. His debut novel, A Particular Kind of Black Man, was published by Simon & Schuster. He'll be speaking with our featured author, Nadia Owusu. She is a Brooklyn-based writer and urban planner. She's the recipient of a 2019 Whiting Award. Her lyric essay, So Devilish a Fire, won the Atlas Review Chapbook Contest. Her writing has appeared or is forthcoming in the New York Times, the Washington Post, The Lily, Literary Review, Electric Literature, Epiphany, and Catapult. Her book, Aftershocks, is a deeply felt memoir about the push and pull of belonging, the seismic emotional toll of family secrets, and the heart it takes to pull through. The book has been felt praised by fellow writers such as Mitchell S. Jackson, Margot Jefferson, Bessie Ipke, and Jessica Andrews who calls Aftershocks a white hot interrogation of the stories we carry in our bodies and the power they have to tear us apart. Owusu illuminates the blood and bones wrought by our borders and teaches us the necessity of owning our narratives when personal and collective histories have been shattered by violence. Nadia is going to start us off with a reading from the book and then she'll be talking with Tofe and with all of you. Nadia, please take it away. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Chelsea. Thank you, Greenlight, for having us. Um, I'm just going to read from uh, the beginning of the book from a chapter called First Earthquake, and I'll just read the first few pages. 
Such a fantastic reading. Thank you so much for that, Nadia. And I have to say, I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. Uh, I read this book at the beginning of the year and loved it and have reread passages of it since then. So congratulations to you on this wonderful book and on the paperback coming out. Um, I guess I wanted to start by asking why you wrote this. What motivated your desire to write this book? Thank you so much for your kind words. Um, I'm such a fan of your work. So I was also very excited um, to get to be in conversation with you today. Um, you. But yeah, so I, I actually, I started writing this book as a private project. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a way for me to kind of overcome the aches of isolation and dislocation and disconnection, um, which I think are all things we're all getting really familiar with right now. Yeah. Um, but but I began writing from a place of grief. You know, I lost my father when I was 13. My mother left when I was two. And because my father worked for the UN, I grew up moving huh. around every, every couple of years, which was in, in many ways a wonderful way to grow up. But in other ways, you know, I felt like I was always saying goodbye to a home. Um, and, you know, all, there was always a lot of loss, even though we didn't necessarily um, acknowledge it. Um, but, but, you know, that kind of grief and loss, it stays with you. And I think um, as I moved into my 20s, I realized that, you know, I was carrying all of this grief and it, it, it was becoming really heavy. And so I had this really strong sense that, that I needed to sort of write into the histories and the cultures of the places that my parents came from, places that I had always been somewhat disconnected from or, or kind of straddling or, you know, sort of a, a little bit on the outside of. Um, I'm what people call a third culture kid, which means that I yeah. grew up outside of my parents' cultures. And although I, you know, I was raised by my Ghanaian father, but I, you know, for example, didn't speak his language. And so there was all, there were always ways in which I was, you know, really kind of longing to belong even within my own family. And because my mother left when I was two, um, my Armenian identity was not something that I understood or really had access to. You know, my father talked to me about um, about my mother's family and culture a little bit, but um, but yeah, for the most part, mm. I I really didn't feel that strong sense of connection and belonging, and and so in my twenties, I, I yeah, I just felt this drive to kind of write myself towards deeper understanding of those places, of those cultures, of my family, of the context in which my parents were sort of making decisions. Um, to, to kind of understand myself better and, and also to understand the other places that I had lived where history was often being made all around me. Sure. Because I went to international schools, you know, we didn't learn about that <clears throat> history very much. We were learning about sort of the history of Europe, not about the civil war, for example, that was taking place in Ethiopia where I lived. And so I wanted to honor all of those histories and cultures and it felt like a really strong impulse and, and almost obsession. And so I was, I was kind of doing that for myself, kind of both writing, you know, the stories of my own life and then putting them next to these histories and seeing where the threads connected and um, going down a lot of rabbit holes of research. But, you know, I did that for quite a long time before I, before I asked myself, okay, is this something that I might make art out of and, and turn into a story that I would share with others as well? Wow. Um... So this kind of leads to something I wanted to ask later, but I'll, I'll ask it now. And that's about the structure. I suppose it's a nerdy literary question. I can't help myself. You know, I hope everyone doesn't mind. But uh, one of the things I admired most about the book is the structure of it. Um, and the fact that there are these kind of essayistic portions of it, and then it goes back into your stories and, and stories about your life, stories about the people you care about and people you don't care about as well. Um, <laughs> and I kind of help but think about like, um, I thought a little bit about Zinzi Clemens' work, What We Lose. I'm not sure if you've had a chance to read that yeah, book, but yeah. she does something kind of similar. It's, it's a different book, but um, I, if there's anything that connects both texts, it's that. So I was wondering how you happened on that strategy. It sounds like it was trial and error, but is it something that you, did you initially plan to write like a straight memoir and then over time began to incorporate more, you know, I suppose, histories about the place where you lived or um, or did you always have that strategy in mind? Yeah, so I think, um, I think a lot of that happened really organically because um, it felt really important to me. Like I really felt that in order to understand, I've always had the sense that history, we are made up of history, you know, we, that, that we carry history within us and that 
that, um, you know, we are sort of history living and breathing. And I remember vividly my father, for example, telling me about how the trauma of the Armenian genocide was in my family's DNA on my mother's side. And he told me that in answer to, you know, the, I had asked him why my mother left when I was really young. And he, he told me that story about the Armenian genocide and said that my mother came from a family that carried a lot of trauma. And I didn't really fully understand that answer at the time or why he was telling me about this history. But, but, but I did get a really strong sense, um, you know, from a very young age that there are ways in which we, we carry history and that idea kind of stuck with me, you know, the, and, and this question of how our histories shape us, um, not just, you know, our experience and choices, but, but who we are and how we feel in the world and in our bodies. And, and, you know, I think also because I grew up moving around so much um, to different countries and, you know, history was, was always being made all around me because of my father's job, we were often following disasters. Yeah. And, you know, my father sort of made sure that I understood because I wasn't learning a lot about what was going on all around me in school. My father kind of made it his job to sort of teach me about those stories. Um, and he was always very much engaged and always telling us about how the conflicts we were living in the midst of were tied to older conflicts, to colonialism and empire and how violences are connected. And of course, you know, as a child, I was very annoyed that like everything became a history lesson. Um, but but it, that really that sense of history really became sort of grounded in, in who I am and how I understand the world, which I think is why when I was coming out of this period of depression, my answer to sort of like, how can I process this and how can I better understand my feelings and how I'm carrying them was to 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 research um, some of these histories. And so, you know, because I, I started doing it just for myself, that was that was a really organic thing at first. Yeah. Um, but but then when I did go back to some of that raw material that I created for myself, um, I did start to ask myself sort of like, how do, how do all of these pieces fit together? Because I had sort of collected a lot of really personal stories and then sort of these like files of research that I had accumulated over time. And but I did because of that natural impulse, which, you know, as a writer, I think like often following what our impulses are is, is can lead us to sort of what the story wants to be as opposed to sure. imposing a structure. Um, so because of that, I, I kind I really had a very strong feeling that I needed this to be a genre fluid book and, and that I wanted to move back and forth between sort of um, but between my private griefs and struggles and these larger forces and I and that part of the project of the book was to show how history is always present in our lives whether we notice or, it or not and so um, so I ended up sort of like going into that material and then sort of finding stories my personal stories and connecting them to those histories um, and so many of the chapters of the book start with a very vivid memory um, such as you know the one that I read today but then they open up into explorations of broader um, philosophies or histories, you know, for example, you know, going on a trip to Ghana with my father opens up into a, a sort of meditation on Pan-African philosophy or that memory of asking my father why my mother left um, in the book sort of opens up into an exploration of the Armenian genocide and my ancestors trek through the Syrian desert um, and becoming American. Um, and so, but I think once you start examining those connections, like so much cracks open and, and so, so I knew that that's really what the book wanted to be and that there wasn't really, I couldn't imagine a way of writing kind of a linear memoir, um, connecting all of the different stories and histories and places and language, languages that are, that are part of who I was and, and who I am. And because that is who I am, I felt like I needed to sort of honor all of that. Yeah, no, I get that completely and understand that impulse. And, you know, it's so interesting. There's so many similarities you know i think in our work in a weird way and sort of in our trajectories as well that it's kind of it's just interesting to think about it because you have just said a lot of things that i've kind of contemplated as as i was writing my book and as i write now um one thing i noticed when i was writing my book is that i had to kind of change in order to write it i don't know if that makes sense but i couldn't be the person i was in order to bring the book into the world the way the book wanted to be mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering what your book required of you as you were, were creating it. I guess another way of asking this is, how did you have to change to bring this story to life? Yeah, that's such a great question. And I definitely see so much, um, 
so much that connects our work on so many levels, just like on the level of theme, on the sort of grappling with identity, on the questions around mental illness and, and you know, inheritance and, and all of those things. There's there's so many themes that, that connect our work. Um, and, and I do have this, I did have this sense that I would, the part of the project of the book was sort of um, moving into uh, more fully into into like new possibilities for who I could be into the world in the world yeah. and you know I was I was coming out of a really dark time and it was almost a matter a question of the of of realizing that you know the ways in which I had worked to survive and to build these survival mechanisms were no longer serving me and they yeah. had served me you know I think that um, it was also important to, to me to honor the ways in which those things were necessary, those mechanisms were necessary for a long time, but I had to realize that I needed to let them go and I needed to, as an adult, you know, um, to sort of grapple with the, the grief and the trauma of my life, that I couldn't run away from it anymore, that I couldn't sort of power my way through it in the ways that I had through achievement, through, you know, accomplishment, all of those things that I felt would sort of solve the problem of Breach. why I was <laughs> breathing. And, and so I needed to sort of be more honest about those stories. And, and that did require me to sort of, uh, to become, you know, a different person, because I was always a person who avoided looking directly at my trauma or my grief. And so I really had to become a person who was open to kind of this deep, uh, reflection and self-examination and you know as a writer I think we we do write to think through the questions that we're carrying and and you know like those questions are often sort of where do I fit into the histories of my family where do I fit into the places that I call home um, and I wanted a deeper kind of um, yeah, sense of connection to those people and places, as I said, but I also, you know, I, I, I did start writing from a place of grief um, and, and sort of examining that grief, as I said, but I also found that through the writing, it opened up so much sort of love and compassion in me yeah. as well, that, that, that because I was hiding from my grief, that I didn't have access to, you know, even sort of the loss of my father, which was one of the the great um, tragedies of my life, you know, he was the, the great hero of my life. He was a, a single father to me and my sister until he remarried, but was always sort of the, the guiding force of my world. And so um, after I lost him, because when I was 13, because I was so resistant to sort of examining that grief and to feeling it fully and um, and I felt like I just, I needed to keep moving forward and powering through it. What that meant was that I also lost access to the love and joy that was so mm. much a part of our relationship. And so in part, sort of writing the book as well, sort of allowed me to reconnect to that as well. That's a great response. And I, I relate to so much of that. Um, and as I think about your book, it seems to me that so much of your book is about the act of like personal storytelling, which is to say the act of creating a narrative about yourself right? Like, and that's something that I struggled mightily with when I was growing up. I didn't know how the hell to define myself, especially relative to other people in my life who seem to have a very solid sense of self-definition or sense of, you know, sort of their place in the world. Um, and it seems like your book is about how the act of personal storytelling is kind of inextricably linked with sanity, right? Like, um, it's about creating a coherent narrative of self, which is something that I suppose all human beings require in order to kind of you know, live and exist and, and uh, be productive. Um, so do you have a coherent sense of self now after this process? And did writing this book help you achieve that? Yeah, that's such a great question. You know, I think I think for me, part of my struggle was sort of the demand that the world has often imposed on me, and like that the world imposes on so many of us to kind of see our see our identities as fixed and have the correct answers. You know, I I can remember being sort of very young and. Um, people asking me where I was from and, you know, depending on who was asking me and what I thought it was that they were after, I would sort of shift my answer. But I remember feeling a lot of anxiety about that. And, you know, I, you know in, in all sorts of contexts, like I, I can remember sort of arriving in Ghana with my father and the, um, some people at the airport, um, I had always been taught to say that I was Ghanaian. I do feel very much, you know, connected to my Ghanaian identity because I was raised by that side of my family. But I remember sort of arriving in Ghana and the, the people who were checking our passports sort of asking where, where, where I was from. 
and and I, you know, I, I sort of confidently at that age said, you know, I'm Ghanaian and they just started laughing and they, yeah. they were questioning, you know, asking me if I spoke Twi and just sort of interrogating me. And I remember getting very flustered about that and, and beginning to doubt, you know, my sense of, of, of who I believed that I was. And then, you know, similarly, um, in, in America, you know, that question of where are you from is so loaded in so many ways um, in terms of what people are actually getting at, which yeah. often what they want to know is sort of your your race or your ethnic background. And um, and uh, yeah, and, I, and, and the truth was that, you know, I, I am made up of all of these different cultures and, um, you know, with with the Armenian side of my family, the Ghanaian side of my family, and then growing up in Uganda, I was born in Tanzania, grew up in Uganda, Ethiopia, Italy, and I have connections to all of those places. But um, often when I sort of spoke about my identity, I felt that people either thought that I was um, hiding something or not being honest or, or, and, or, uh, like that I didn't have a coherent narrative and that I couldn't easily answer the question and that that immediately made me suspect to some people. Yeah. Um, and I have, I've also had shifting accents, you know, moving as <laughs> I had. And so that confuses people sometimes, you know, if I have a slip in accent, um, uh, I used to have a very British accent. Now I have an American accent, but sometimes it moves back and forth and, um, and so I think for me, like the, the, the kind of the feeling that I needed to have a coherent narrative or like a clear answer about, you know, who I was, was a sense of, of great anxiety. And I think part of what I discovered through the writing, um, and, and yes, I was sort of crafting a story. Um, so, so I was crafting a narrative, but it was a narrative that felt like it was coming from my real sense of curiosity about who I was, as opposed to this imposed sense or these expectations that were placed on me. And, and I was able to sort of, um, to, to kind of embrace all of the parts of who I am and to define home really expansively. You know, I often thought of myself as someone who didn't have roots or had, you know, a kind of a weak connection to my roots. But what I, what I discovered through the writing and part of the story that I claimed for myself was that actually I have very expansive roots. Um, and that all of the places that I had called home were mine in complicated ways, but those complications are actually a huge part of who I am and are not this shameful thing that I should be afraid about, um, sort of allowing people to know about me. Yeah, no, that's, I completely get that. So it sounds like you're saying that, um, that you didn't have to kind of arrive at a coherent narrative, that, that you just, is that, is that right? That, yeah? Yeah, sort of. I mean, I guess, I guess in one way, the, the narrative is that, you know, that, um, that I'm rejecting the expectation that I should have an easy answer, right? Like that yeah. is still an, a narrative in and of itself. Yeah. And sort of what I, what I um, let go of was like that there's a right answer to those questions or that there's a fixed answer, you know, that, that, that I don't have a shifting sense of self. Like I think we all do in many ways, but I think yeah. particularly for those of us who grew up straddling worlds, like we've had to kind of become chameleons. And like, uh, I, I, I fully understand why that can sometimes be interpreted as sort of, um, dishonest or confusing or can, um, raise questions for people. But at the same time, I guess my coherent narrative was was um, sort of was was saying that that is the story of who I am. That all of these parts are the story of who I am. Um, yeah. Yeah, which kind of aligns with the structure you've created for your book as well. I mean, the book is also saying in its own way, like you know, take me as I am. You know, even if I'm not sort of fixed in one particular way of of being in the world. Um, you reference a lot of art in your book. You know, you talk about Toni Morrison and your love of her and a bunch of other sort of fantastic writers, also jazz and Coltrane and those kinds of people. Um, and then, you know, Peter Gunn's the Lord, you know, like uh, rappers from your time that you <laughs> arrived in New York. Uh, I was wondering if you could say a bit more about the kind of art you were engaging with as you wrote this and how that art influenced the book. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was reading a lot of um, a lot of kind of stories that were uh, like engaged with searching for roots, um, and I defined that sort of really broadly. So, so certainly, you know, Toni Morrison. There's a lot of sort of journeys towards roots in a lot of her novels. Um, 
I was also reading a lot of memoirs that were sort of grappling with questions of, of mental illness. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, I was reading those narratives because I was looking, I was searching for, for wisdom within them. Like I felt like, um, that, that they would enable me to sort of, um, see this search that I was on as part of kind of a, uh, like a, a part of the human experience, you know, as opposed to this really lonely, um, thing that I was going through. Um, I also was listening to a lot of um, music. I was listening, you know, I reconnected to listening to high life music, which was my father's music, yeah, yeah. Um, Afrobeat. My father was also a big um, jazz fan, and he used to talk to me a lot about jazz when I was growing up. And I really liked, you know, what I was doing as I was writing in some ways. And I found this really interesting, particularly as I thought about tracing my roots as someone who has, you know, I was coming to this idea of having really expansive roots, was the ways in which all of the, those those forms of music are connected and there are conversations between them. Right? So you yeah. can hear sort of the, the Ashanti rhythms, you know, my father is from the Ashanti tribe of Ghana, and you can hear those rhythms, those really ancient ryth rhythms that are still part of everyday life in Ghana, you can hear them in jazz. Um, and... And then you can hear jazz sort of returned to Africa and sort of informed Afrobeat, you mm -hmm. know? And so I think that conversation across the diaspora was really important to me because it spoke to sort of my experience as a black woman who is American and African and, um, and you know, those identities can often be seen as being in conflict. You know, the immigrant um, black experience and the African-American black experience are complicated. Um, and we're, we have been in re relationship, whether that's in, in terms of the fight for, um, for uh, independence in Africa and the connection to the civil rights movement in America or yeah. in the roots of the, this music and the conversation between the, this music. But at the same time, the narrative that is often sort of um, presented is that there is there's a lot of tension within those relationships and certainly there is tension but i think there is also you know so much shared history and a shared sense of um of who we are in the world and a sense of shared fates in so many ways and so that was sort of what i was connecting to as well having spent much of my adult life in the united states yeah no uh so one thing i wanted to ask you when uh i sort of heard that this would be happening is something that I've been grappling with in my own life for some time. And, um, and I'm interested to get your take on it. And it's about your work life. Um, so in their virtual green room, we talked about where we're working. And I remember reading somewhere that you worked at Living Cities for a bit. Um, and now, according to The Guardian, you're the director of storytelling at Frontline Solutions. That's funny, because I was a sort of vice president of storytelling at LISC. And now I have another job. And one thing that a lot of people, so that so the connections continue. Um, one thing that a lot of people, like people who are writers and people who are writers will ask is like, at what point will you kind of like abandon everything else and commit your life entirely to writing? And uh, the response that I always give is that that's not a great ambition of mine. Like I intend to do like to write great books and be fully involved and invested in a kind of artistic life. But I am also like interested in doing other stuff as well. And to the extent that I can, I'm trying to do both. And perhaps it's like insanity, but at this point, it's something I'm committed to. Uh, I'm wondering about your kind of relationship to work. If do, if do you envision for yourself a kind of stepping outside of the work space and, and committing to life, to, to writing entirely, or if you intend to continue doing both? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm like asking myself, like, are we the same person? Like, there's so many commonalities. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, like you, I, I, I don't, it's not as though I'm working towards quitting my day job, you know, which is often sort of the way the question is asked. Um, I, I'm very passionate about what I do sort of in the social justice space and the kind of work that I do. And I feel like the questions that I'm asking in that work are really connected to my curiosities as a writer. And so they are, um, yeah, they, they like speak to each other in really interesting ways. You know, I'm, I'm in my work um, at Living Cities and like, uh, and, and, and in the stories that I'm sort of mining for um, my work at Frontline, I'm asking sort of who places serve and why, like how people feel a sense of security and of belonging. Um, and, and it's really important in, in sort of the kind of work I do to reckon with and learn from history. You know, there are so many um, 
as we've seen so much, um, I mean, this has always been true, but I think a big part of the conversation of last summer was this question of what ideologies and philosophies are baked into the systems that exist now and how do we undo them? And like part of uh, my work as a writer is thinking about how do I undo those um, those philosophies that are baked into who I am as a person, you know? Um, and so I think those things are so connected and I feel like my my artist life benefits from the work that I'm doing out in the world and I'm able to then bring the creativity of my artist life into that world. And so, um, I don't know. I mean, I think it, it's possible that sort of my relationship to that work might shift and I might do different kinds of work um, over time. But yeah, I'm not sort of like the, the way that I see my trajectory isn't like in a rush towards like quitting my day job per se. I mean, it's always a balancing act though. You know, yeah. we were sort of talking about that before. Like I think as writers, we need a lot of time. And so <laughs> it's difficult <laughs> to sort of balance all of the things, but, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about both. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think we're fortunate to live in this like incredible time where there are all kinds of really wonderful narratives that are emerging about people you know, like us who have grappled with identity, who have grappled with the kind of mental instability that accompanies like traveling from a place that you know and love to a place that perhaps doesn't love you. Um, and the thing that I'm most excited about as a writer is the fact that, you know, I remember vividly, for example, I was a senior, I think it was a senior in college when Purple Hibiscus dropped by Chimanda. Um, and, uh, and I was just sort of besotted with that book. And I have other opinions about her that we don't have to discuss, but I was, I was like, this is incredible that somebody's written this book because the last book I'd read was Nervous Conditions like a couple of years before that. And so it seemed like once every five years, it was a book that, you know, kind of talked about my parents' life in some way or the kind of life that I was, that talked about Pepe Soup. I saw that in your book. I was elated to see that. Um, <laughs> I love Pepe Soup. Um, so I, I'm wondering how you feel about like writing at this moment, because, um, you know, I'll say the controversial thing. I, I think that publishing is still like falling on its face with respect to people like us and not doing as good a job as it could do. Um, even though, you know, you've had great success that is warranted with your book and I've been fortunate in certain ways as well. I'm wondering how you feel about writing at this moment. Yeah, I mean, that's such a great question and one that I've, you know, been thinking about so much. And one of the joys of the past year, you know, it has been, of course, I didn't plan to publish a book in, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, but one of the joys of this past year is that despite sort of the, the ways in which we've all kind of been in our homes and unable to travel and to meet people in person, at the same time, I have felt this really strong sense of camaraderie with other Black writers, writers of color, writers from the African diaspora, um, and have been able to sort of like begin to have these sorts of conversations about sort of what it means to be writing in this moment and sort of uh, the challenges um, of sort of um, meeting the expectations of what is still a very white publishing world, you know, um, and at the same time, uh, like rejecting those expectations and, and yeah. sort of writing the more nuanced, you know, I, I was having a conversation today with another African writer and we were talking about you know, both of us sort of engage a lot with African history in our books and, and somebody was asking us sort of why that was so important and, um, you know, that, that the kind of work that we were writing is sort of non-traditional in the Western sense in, in that it's it's not sort of linear, it doesn't, yeah. you know, move in one direction. And, and, you know, my sort of, my sense of that was that, like, well, we're African, like, we don't see time that way. And so, like, we the <laughs> presumption in that question yeah. is, is it sort of like presumes like the centrality of the white Western um, experience of the world. You know, for us, like we've always, our ancestors are present where past, future and history coexist. There are circles within circles and we're always moving between them. And and so th that, that, that sense of history, I think for a lot of us is so, is so important. And then also we were talking about sort of the, the importance of writing. Um, you know, I write about this in, in my book, but but the fact that African history was so left out of my education, yeah. um, like I rarely learned anything about African history. And when I did, it was d typically focused on, on colonialism um, and the colonial experience, maybe a little bit about the independence movements in college, but, 
Um, but a lot of that sort of uh, history, even even that history that I got that was about the independence movements, a lot of it was written by white people, right? And it leaves out a lot of the the nuance around what existed in pre-colonial Africa. And you know, and so for that, like I think for me, sort of turning to my elders and and you know asking for their stories and histories, which were often sort of uh, much more nuanced and complex than the stories about um, about Africa that were given. And so the, the importance of sort of telling those stories from our own perspective, and you know, that's part of the conversation that I think the publishing world is having now about own voices and authenticity. And I think that those are really important conversations. And at, at the same time, there's, there's still, I think, so much work to do um, because the, the, the expectation is still that um, that the, the sort of central p position um, is, is sort of the white uh, experience. Yes, amen. <laughs> um, I see a couple questions in the chat. So I'll ask one question before going there. And it's about, I think you write really honestly and searingly about um, privilege and your relationship with privilege in a way that I was surprised by and pleased with as somebody who's also grappled with all kinds of privilege. And the thing that you're honest about in the book is that at certain points in your life, you've had privilege relative to those around you, especially, especially at those moments when uh, you were part of like international communities in places like Uganda and perhaps even Ethiopia, that you had privilege relative to some of the folks there. And other times in your life, obviously, when you didn't have that privilege, you know, when you moved to America and you're kind of figuring stuff out. Um, I'm wondering what, um, what your relationship with privilege is now, if that's something you, you think about and how you conceptualize that. Yeah, I mean, I think moving to America was really interesting to me in terms of the resistance that people have, um, and you know, I would say largely white people have about acknowledging privilege, um, because I think that there is this really central narrative, which is not an Af African narrative that was not very common in my upbringing about individualism and like individual achievement. Um, and, you know, of course, like there, there's the stereotype of the African immigrant parents, the achievement is definitely part of our narrative, but it's yeah. about achieving for the collective. It's yeah. not about sort of like this individualistic, um, view of the world. And, and so when I arrived here and found, you know, I had always, but my father, it was always a part of the story that my father told me about who I was, um, was always that, you know, it was only for, uh, you know, because of circumstance, luck, hard work, all of those things that sort of made my life the way that it was. And that there was very little actually that separated me from, for example, the people in the refugee camps who he was, um, you know, delivering food aid to. And that was always a story that I grew up with and was aware of, you know, like, I don't think he called it privilege, but but that was definitely a conversation and, a, and an awareness that I grew up having. Um, and, um, and so when I came here and was confronted by this sort of resistance to sort of examining the ways in which we have advantage and the ways in which it is possible to both have advantage and also experience oppression and, and have disadvantage in certain circumstances was was very confusing to me at first yeah. um, because I didn't understand sort of the, the ethos to which it was connected. And now, of course, I have a much clearer sense of that ethos, like the ethos around the American dream. And, you know, if you work hard, you will succeed. And like, um, you know, even the conversation that we're having now about sort of freedoms and um, the freedoms to not wear a mask, for example, <laughs> you know, which is like something that you know, in, in, in places that are sort of more focused on, on sort of a collective way of living is something that would be, you know, very foreign in a lot of ways. But, you know, that was always, I, I felt like it was really important for me to be really honest and reckon with those things, because I think it adds to like the, the, the need to have more complex conversations about, about privilege, about advantage, about oppression, about colorism, about racism, like all of the, we experience all of those things in different ways, depending on sort of our, where we are at the time, our, our positionality, um, our relationship to um, the places and the people that we live among. And so it was really important to me to sort of make to, to tell the truth about how complex all of those things have been in my life. Yeah, no, it's a great, great answer. Um, looking at the chat now, uh, let's see, Christine Brown uh, says, I am a black woman adopted and raised by a white family who was very racist. 
It took me years to reconcile my black identity without the lens of white supremacy. How did you heal these racial aftershocks? Hmm. That's a great question. I mean, I think healing is a process, right? I don't, I, th I think it's an ongoing process. Um, I, I think in terms of the white side of my family, I wouldn't say that I experienced a lot of outright racism um, from the white side of my family. I also did, I was raised by the black side of my family. So, you know, like that experience was, um, was, was different for me. I think that it was really important to me, however, to sort of reckon with whiteness and my relationship to whiteness and, you know, and particularly in terms of the Armenian side of my family, I thought that it was a really, you know, as I was doing the research and I discovered that actually Armenians, when they arrived in America, um, petitioned a court to be considered white. And so that, you know, I was not aware of that history and that previously they had been uh, racially classified as Asian or Asiatic Turks. And so that, when I learned that, I was like, oh, like this is yet another example of, you know, the ways in which race is truly a social construct and that, um, that whiteness is a specious thing. Um, and, and so that sort of like opened up like my ability to have the, this kind of meditation on race, um, meditation on colorism. And like, those are questions, you know, I guess to, to kind of come back to the question about how you heal them. I think like being really honest about those things with ourselves, if we're not able to have, to be honest with our families for whatever reasons is, is really, is really important. You know, I did, I did have a lot of those conversations with the Armenian side of my family as I, I went in, I became sort of uh, closer to them and was in relationship with them. And so we were able to have conversations about race. And, and I think that that dialogue did help me to sort of um, move through some of the questions that I was carrying about sort of how race factored into my experience of the world. Yeah. Um, let's see. Christine Brown would also like to know what books both Nadia and Sophie are currently reading and what authors inspire each of them. I'll let you answer first because I got to collect. <laughs> come up with something to say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I talk a, a lot about some of the writers that I, yeah. I really admire in my book. And I and I so I think at some point in the book, I, I write about sort of having this council of mothers uh, that included Toni Morrison, Audre Lorde. You talked about Titi Dangaremba, def definitely um, her, um, Zora Neale Hurston, June Jordan, um, as sort of an urbanist and a writer has been a big influence on me. Yeah. Um, and then also, you know, as I was as I was writing, as I said, I was also reading a lot of of, um, stories about that were engaged in sort of reckoning with uh, writers who were sort of engaged with reckoning with the stories of their lives and struggles and big global challenges on the page. So, you know, Jessamine War Ward's memoir, Men We Reaped, was important to me. Um, Zadie Smith's essays, um, Negro Land by Margot Jefferson. Um, yeah, so many stories. Uh, Bassi Ickpies, I'm Telling the Truth But I'm Lying, which came out sort of after I had largely written the book, but then when I read it, there was so much recognition in, in her work and Kiesi Lehmann's heavy, yeah, so many. Yeah, same lineup of writers for me in many ways. Um, and of course the ubiquitous and, you know, Baldwin is somebody who has definitely had an impact and um, you know, I just, a friend of mine gave me this book a couple of days ago. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. It's called The Flagellants. It's by Carlene Hatcher Polite, apparently a cousin or somehow related to Toni Morrison. It's a book by a black woman that came out in the sixties, published in France first, and then by FSG in the States. Um, it's about, a, I think it's a couple that is kind of breaking up a black couple that's breaking up in, in, uh, France. It's a really interesting book. Um, and not one that I encountered before. And to me, it's kind of, it's been incredible to engage with this book because um, she's grappling with some of the same concerns that I'm grappling with now. And whenever, you know, folks, folks, let me be more specific. A lot of times when critics in particular talk about work by writers of color, they kind of collapse everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I think they're fond of referencing like one writer. Um, and, and the other thing that bothers me too is that there's not a lot of conversation about craft when um, critics talk about black writers. They talk about the story more than, than they talk about the craft, um, which is I think highly unfortunate. And I've opined on this in other places, but um, it's, it's really great to kind of see somebody who is grappling with craft in all kinds of interesting ways. 
Um, so I've been reading and enjoying that book of late. Um, let's see, uh, one more question in the chat. Were you able to connect with any Armenian writers? Any thoughts on the philosophical challenges, oppression, being victims of layers of supremacist systems facing Armenians still living on their indigenous lands and Armenians in the diaspora? That's a big question. <laughs> but it's a very big question. That's a big question. That's a very big question. <laughs> but I think, um, I think, so the answer, yes, I have been able to, it, the, one, of, uh, the, one of the other gifts of, of this process is that um, sort of through the writing of the book, I was, um, in some ways, I was sort of writing myself toward reconciliation with, with my mother, which then opened up the whole Armenian side of my family. And it has been really beautiful to be in relationship with them, to learn more about the Armenian culture um, and and sort of the stories that I didn't really have access to when I was growing up. And, and doing that research for myself also sort of really opened um, allowed me to feel more connected um, to that side of my heritage um, as well. And then also with the book coming out, um, I've been sort of really overwhelmed by how, you know, so many Armenian writers and um, Armenian readers have reached out to me um, in such lovely ways and offered their, you know, I'm still very much a learner um, about the Armenian side of my family. And so it's been really wonderful to be in conversation um, with folks. And I think one of the things that I recognized through those conversations and also through the, the research that I was doing was, you know, the way, you know, I was talking about sort of the Armenian experience in America, but also, you know, I have been sort of learning more because, because that's sort of my family's experience of coming over, um, escaping genocide and, and they um, settled in, in the United States. But I have also been sort of connecting with Armenians across the diaspora, which has been really interesting to sort of learn about that rich history and also the unique sort of experiences of um, of oppression and um, of sort of uh, yeah the, the ways in which Armenians similarly have sort of grappled with some of the same challenges that I have been writing about from the black experience as well and so seeing the connection between those two sides of my heritage has been really important and is an ongoing sort of point of curiosity and exploration for me as I continue to learn and move through the world. Cool. Uh, we're bumping up at 8.30, so I think we have an hour, if I'm not mistaken, right? So I'll ask one final question, one that is taken from a quote in your book, so I'll read it now. It says, the idea of roots setting a person free is counterintuitive, but deracination from the past, from land, from family, from mothers, makes for an unstable present. We must have, or we will always search for, a place to bury our bones. So my final question to you is, do you have a place to bury your bones? <laughs> Um, I think, you know, I, I, I do, you know, I, I, I think that I actually have a few places to bury my bones now. And I think, you know, through these efforts to, to sort of come to a deeper sense of knowledge and understanding of those places, um, that I, I do feel such a, um, still a complicated connection, but such a strong sense of connection that I now claim those heritages. Like now I, I feel much more confident if somebody asks me sort of where I'm from or about my background, saying both that I'm Ghanaian and Armenian. You know, like I, I feel like for much of my life, that was a question that I sort of felt very nervous about. And so I think um, this sense of sort of connection to those histories has allowed me to to see, and, and those are diasporic communities, by the way. So I think like it's not necessarily the the, the land itself, um, but it's yeah. more the sense of community that I have claimed yeah. in really important ways. Wonderful, wonderful. So I think we're at the end. I've really enjoyed speaking with you, Nadia. Congratulations again on your tremendous book. It's oh, been thank pleasure. you so much. This is so lovely. Thanks for all your great questions. Thank you, Nadia and Tope, for such a wonderful conversation. And thank all of you for coming here virtually tonight and sharing the space for connection with us. Uh, a reminder to everyone that you can buy Nadia's memoir, Aftershocks, from Greenlight, um, either in store at our um, either of our Brooklyn locations. We're open noon to seven daily or online at greenlightbookstore.com. You can find that buy link in the chat and you can also get a signed copy of Aftershocks through Greenlight right now. Just make sure if you're ordering online to request a signed copy in the order comments at checkout. And you can also buy Tope's very excellent novel, A Particular Kind of Black Man, through Greenlight in store or on our website. 
Thank you all so much again for an excellent evening and have a wonderful rest of your night. Thank you so much, Green Light. <laughs>